Amen. Worship God's word I want to consider with you on this Transfiguration Sunday is the second lesson we heard, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. Dear friends, every year we set aside this one Sunday to focus on this one particular event from Jesus' earthly life and ministry, his transfiguration. The word in the Greek means to change in appearance. And as we just heard from Matthew there, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up onto a high mountain where Jesus' form and appearance changed. His face shines like the sun. How bright is that? His clothes are dazzling white like the light. Truly a spectacular sight to behold. But there's one detail that very often gets missed about Jesus' transfiguration. We didn't hear about it in Matthew's account, but Luke does record a couple extra details for us. Most likely, this happened at night. How do we know that? Because Luke's account tells us that the disciples were sleeping. Jesus had taken them up on this high mountain. He's, he's praying up there and the disciples are dozing off. Sounds kind of familiar, right? And then all of a sudden his face shines like the sun. His clothes become dazzling white. And if that weren't spectacular enough, there all of a sudden... Alive and glorified are two iconic prophets from old, the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah, and they're having a conversation with Jesus. And what are Peter, James, and John doing? Sleeping. Guys, pay attention. You know, it's not hard to imagine. Peter, as he is thinking back on, on this event, it's not hard to imagine him wishing that somebody had kind of been there to, to, to elbow them a little bit, to nudge them and say, hey, pay attention to what's going on. And so it's fitting then that here in, in 2 Peter, when Peter is making reference to this very event, Jesus' transfiguration, that is exactly what he tells his readers, you and me, to do. Pay attention. Pay attention to what happened on that mountain. A little more on this conversation that Jesus was having with Moses and Elijah. We might wonder, why those two guys? Yes, those are two of the most famous, well-known, highly regarded prophets from Israel's Old Testament history. If you were to ask a Jew in Jesus' day which of the prophets they'd like to meet, chances are Moses and Elijah would be right at the top of that list. But consider this also. Both Moses and Elijah had their own experience. Having a conversation with God on a mountain. Mount Sinai, a.k.a. Mount Horeb. Yes, both men, during their earthly lives, had a conversation with God. Both men heard the voice of God, and now here they were, alive and glorified, once again on a mountain, but not Sinai. And once again, they're having a conversation with God. Who is standing in the flesh in front of them. Pay attention. What do you think that says about who Jesus is? He is truly God. How about some more? 
we may wonder what Jesus was talking about with Moses and Elijah. And once again, it's Luke's account that gives us that extra little detail. Luke tells us that they were talking about Jesus' upcoming departure that he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. What a contrast. Because on, on the outside, according to external appearance, you have Jesus' face shining like the sun, his clothes are dazzling white. Moses and Elijah are alive and glorified there, talking with Jesus. Everything about that situation is glorious. Yet what are they talking about? The topic of conversation is Jesus' death. On that occasion, that is the focus. Pay attention. What do you think that has to say about the importance of that topic? About the importance of Jesus' death on a cross? Now, just in case all of that weren't enough, you also have this, you know, small matter of God the Father himself booming his voice from heaven, saying, this is my son, my loved one. With him I am well pleased. Yes, the Father loves his son. But the son would still go to the cross. Yes, the father approves of his son. And it's for that reason that the son must go to the cross. Because only his holy life, his perfect life, as the son of God, is going to be sufficient of a payment for you and me to take away all of our sins. Only his life can be a ransom for ours. Pay attention. Because everything, everything that happened on that Mount of Transfiguration points us to the central message of our faith, points us to the central message that God would have us know and believe. Jesus, true God, becomes man, veils his glory so that he could offer his life on a cross that we too, just like Moses and Elijah, would one day be glorified with him. Pay attention. Because all of this is relayed to us by an eyewitness. Listen again to what Peter wrote. To be sure, we were not following cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the powerful appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Yes, take it from the eyewitness. The whole episode sounds just too fantastical, but it's real. It happened. This isn't just a story that Peter made up. And how do we know that? How do we know Peter's not making the whole thing up along with James and John? Well, consider the fact that in the original Greek, the word that Peter used here to, to say that these stories were not cleverly concocted also implies the idea of being self-serving. Consider the fact that probably within the next year of writing these words, the Apostle Peter would be put to death for such testimony about Jesus being the Son of God and Savior of the world. A cleverly devised, self-serving myth? I don't think so. If the person who devises it is going to die for it, that's not self-serving. Pay attention. When Peter writes, yeah, I was there. Yes, I saw it. Yes, I heard it. Because after that, he writes something that is, it, it just jumps off the page at you. 
Now, have you ever had an experience that is just so extraordinary, so wonderful, that you want to tell other people about it? But you just find that words are not enough to adequately describe it. And so you just kind of throw your hands up and give up and say, ah, you just, you just had to be there. You had to be there to fully understand. You had to be there to get it. Or maybe you've been on the receiving end of that conversation where somebody's trying to tell you this wonderful experience they had, something truly extraordinary, but they end up telling you, ah, you just had to be there. You just had to see it. You just had to experience it in order to understand. Peter doesn't say that here. He doesn't say you had to be on that mountain with Jesus like we were in order to fully understand it. Notice what he does say. We also have the completely reliable prophetic word. And if I may be so bold as to tweak the translation a little bit there to more accurately reflect the literal Greek, we also have the more reliable prophetic word. And then he goes on to say, and you would do well to pay attention to it. No, you and I weren't there that day on the holy mountain as much as we wish we would have been there with Peter, James, and John seeing this and experiencing it. But we have the very word of God. And we would do well to pay attention to it. So how are we doing on that? How are we doing on paying attention to God's Word? You know, when I've had a long day of work and I am tired and drained and exhausted and I go home, what do I do to recharge? Do I crack open the Bible and let God the Holy Spirit renew me? Or do I pick up the remote and queue up some Netflix? or bury my face in my phone and scroll mindlessly. Is time in God's word, whether it's here at church or at home in our own personal or family devotion time, are are those the things in our lives that are immovable? Do we schedule everything else around spending time with God and his word? listening to God and his word, or is it kind of the other way around? Is it too much to be at church for two hours? For worship and Bible class? And just an hour in worship? Yeah, we can get pretty spiritually sleepy like the disciples, can't we? And so thanks be to God that in his word today, God, through the words of the apostle Peter, those written words that Peter wrote down, but they're God's words, make no mistake about it. God tells us, hey, pay attention. You would do well to pay attention to this sure prophetic word. It's in force, it's valid, it's reliable, it's a solid foundation. What we have in God's word is not just a collection of random stories made up by a bunch of different people over centuries and centuries and centuries and centuries and they just happen to all say the same exact thing pointing to one savior from sin. No, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We were not on that mountain that day to hear the voice of God booming from heaven, but brothers and sisters, make no mistake about it, we hear the voice of God booming in the pages of his word, and we would do well to pay attention to it. Words like these, all of us have become like something unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. All of us have withered like a leaf and our guilt carries us away like the wind. That is the voice of God speaking to you and me. Pay attention. The sacrifices God wants are a broken spirit, a broken and crushed heart, O God, you will not despise. That is the voice of God speaking to you and me today. Pay attention. 
Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He was delivered over to death for our sins and he was raised to life for our justification. That is the very voice of God speaking to you through his word. Pay attention. Because I live, you also will live. We are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Take heart, your sins are forgiven. Those are the very words of God. That is the voice of God speaking to you and me through the word. Brothers and sisters, can you ever hear it enough? Pay attention. And so to borrow the words of Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration, it is good. It's good for us to be here, just as it was good for them to be on the mountain, to see that display of Jesus' glory, and to hear the voice of God the Father. Yes, it's good for us to be here, because here we get to hear the voice of God speaking to us in his word. Here we get to see the glory of our Lord Jesus in water and the word, washing away sin. Here we get to see the glory of Jesus where his body and blood is in communion with the bread and wine given and shed for us to wash away all of our sins. Yes, here still today, God comes to us with grace and mercy in word and sacrament, delivering forgiveness and salvation. And surely we don't want to miss it. So brothers and sisters, pay attention. Amen. Please stand.